My grandson David encountered his inaugural winter this year. The weather report indicated that it was an exceptionally cold day, setting a record. Concern gripped me as thoughts about David and his mother, Yvonne, plagued my mind. I couldn't help but worry that they might have fallen ill due to the intense cold. That night, I sent a message to Yvonne via my smartphone, asking about their well-being and ensuring they were not catching a cold. Despite sending the message two or three times, there was no response, not even a read received. Yvonne has always been responsible, but the lack of reply heightened my anxiety. After waiting for another hour without any communication, I attempted to call, but my efforts proved futile. This was no trivial matter, and I began to fear that something serious might have happened. Without wasting any time, I threw on my thick jumper and hastily headed out to drive to my son's family apartment. When I arrived, there was no response to my attempts to ring the intercom. Fearing the worst, that Yvonne had collapsed inside, I approached the building manager to open the door. Upon entering, the apartment was enveloped in darkness, with only the faint light from street lamps penetrating the space. Fumbling along the wall, I searched for the light switch based on my memory. Despite several attempts, the lights refused to turn on, leaving me perplexed and anxious. In desperation, I used my smartphone's flashlight to illuminate the surroundings. Yvonne, are you there? I called out contemplating whether they might be out. Just as I was about to leave, a faint cry echoed from the bedroom. Hastening towards it, I discovered Yvonne shivering from the cold, desperately wrapping newborn David in a sheet to keep him warm. To my shock, I noticed Yvonne's once long and proud black hair had been almost completely shaved off. Overwhelmed by the scene, I exclaimed, What happened here? My name is Mary Smith a 61-year-old woman who has worked as a hairstylist for many years, operating a salon from my home. Engaging in casual conversations with my regulars during their appointments has always been the highlight of my day. The salon, initially started by my husband and me, faced challenges when he passed away from cancer at a young age, not long after our son Harry was born. Despite the hardships, I raised Harry single-handedly. However, he made it challenging, frequently skipping school and getting into trouble when he did attend. After high school, instead of pursuing further education, Harry chose to spend his days idling around town. I often found myself pondering whether Harry's struggles and rebellious behavior stemmed from a sense of inferiority due to the absence of a father figure or perhaps my own shortcomings as a mother. The uncertainty about Harry's future lingered, and I could never quite find a satisfying answer to these questions. Then, out of the blue, Harry declared one day, I want to be a hairstylist. The announcement caught me by surprise, and I pinched my cheek, half expecting to wake up from what seemed like a dream. What's gotten into you? Hairstylists are popular with the ladies, right? Harry responded with a smirk remarking how kids tend to grow up influenced by their parents. Despite the uncertainty about his sudden career choice, I chose to view Harry's newfound interest in his future positively. He successfully graduated from cosmetology school and began working as an apprentice at a senior stylist's salon. It was during this time that he crossed paths with Ivan, who would eventually become his wife. Harry, captivated by her at first sight, pursued her ardently and confidently declared to me, I've decided to marry this girl, introducing me to Yvonne. Nice to meet you. I'm Yvonne. You're a hairstylist too, right? I look forward to learning from you, she said with a bright smile and long black hair. I instantly liked her, and our mutual anticipation for the future was evident. A year into their marriage, Harry expressed his desire to start his own salon. Despite being relatively new to the industry, he exuded confidence as a hairstylist. I want to have my own place and prove my skills, he proclaimed. Although I couldn't shake off my concerns, knowing firsthand the challenges newcomers face in the industry, I couldn't ignore the earnestness in Harry's eyes as he spoke about his dream. Curious about his financial preparedness, I inquired about his savings. With a troubled look, Harry showed me his bank book and sighed. Despite having a steady income, he was spending as much as he earned. 
it became evident that with this spending pattern, he was far from accumulating enough to start his own business. Most of his earnings had been dissipating on leisure activities. Maybe I should have considered advising him to reconsider, but instead, I smiled and reassured him, don't worry about the money, indulge your way. Perhaps it was my way of compensating for the loneliness Harry experienced growing up without a father. Truthfully, I hadn't touched the life insurance money left by my late husband. It was reserved for Harry. Whispering to my husband's portrait, I sought his forgiveness. One of my regulars, well-versed in real estate, provided guidance. A property that had functioned as a barber shop until six months ago became available when the owner retired due to old age. The location seemed promising, and my acquaintance believed it would be a suitable start for Harry. Consulting with others during the renovation, someone offered their husband's assistance, and another mentioned that my son, studying architecture, could contribute during his summer break. Thanks to this collaborative effort, the construction progressed smoothly, and once the health department approved, the salon opened swiftly. Setting up my own business happened more quickly than I had imagined. I advised Harry to express gratitude to everyone, emphasizing that it wasn't something he could have achieved alone. When I handed Harry the bank book containing his father's inheritance, there was still more than half remaining due to lower than expected costs for the purchase and renovation. It was a gift from his father intended for business expenses. I cautioned him to use it wisely, and Harry, though chuckling in annoyance, acknowledged, Yeah, yeah, I'm not a kid. I get it. Yvonne, with a bright smile, assured me, don't worry. I'll keep a close eye on Harry to make sure he doesn't spend the money foolishly. With her support, I felt relieved and decided to watch over their business from a distance. However, my optimism proved misplaced as Yvonne occasionally updated me on their progress and her expressions grew more somber each time. Three months after Harry's salon opened, Yvonne confided, Harry's not putting his heart into the work. I don't understand why. He was so enthusiastic at first, confident that his skills would attract customers. Within a month, Harry's demeanor shifted drastically. The once smiling salon owner started treating customers coldly, leading to a significant decline in our reputation, and customers began staying away. It was baffling to hear this news, considering how fervently Harry had desired his own salon. What had changed in such a short period? Harry seemed to believe that being a skilled hairstylist was sufficient, failing to grasp that running a salon entails more than just quality work. Yvonne sighed, emphasizing the importance of customer service in the business. It became apparent that Harry lacked this fundamental understanding. Concerned, I inquired about Harry's current actions. Yvonne shared that he was frustrated with the lack of customers and spent his days drinking. If he didn't turn things around soon, we risked losing even more clients. Yvonne was handling the existing customers, but if our reputation continued to plummet, the situation would only worsen. Feeling the weight of the situation, I assure Yvonne, I'll have a serious talk with him next time I see him. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. She bowed deeply, brushing back her long black hair. Trying to lighten the mood, I commented on her stunning hair to which she proudly explained that she had been growing it out since middle school for hair donation. Curious, I asked for more details about hair donation, as it wasn't an area I knew much about. Yvonne's eyes sparkled as she explained the process of making wigs from real hair for children who had lost their hair due to congenital diseases, illnesses, or accidents. She expressed her desire to contribute to organizations involved in this cause, describing it as a wonderful way to help someone. Impressed by Yvonne's passion, I commended her for such an admirable commitment, especially considering her youth. Six months into her marriage with Harry, Yvonne became pregnant. Despite her conscientious nature, always pushing herself too hard, she maintained a positive outlook. Concerned about her well-being, I repeatedly warned her about not overdoing it during this crucial time. However, Yvonne would just laugh it off, assuring me, don't worry. I'm taking it easy while consulting with the baby growing in her belly. In reality, Yvonne continued working at the salon right up until the last month of her pregnancy, supporting the family while Harry's attitude deteriorated. 
Each time Ivan updated me, I couldn't help but feel my own shortcomings as a mother. One day, finishing work early, I decided to check on their salon. I encountered Harry just as he was about to leave. Where are you going? Out for a drink? There won't be any more customers today anyway, he said nonchalantly, laughing off his situation. The lack of customers had become the norm for Harry, and he wasn't making an effort to improve things anymore. You're about to become a father, you know, I reminded him. Harry waved dismissively and hopped on his motorcycle, saying, Yeah, yeah, I'll think about it when I feel like it. Frustrated, I insisted. We're not done talking. Think about Yvonne for once. He sped off, leaving me concerned. Inside the salon, I found Yvonne cleaning the floor. Today, we managed to get just one customer, she said, smiling brightly despite looking exhausted. I expressed my concern about her nutrition and reminded her it was not just about her, but also for the baby. Hey, Vani teared up a bit and thanked me, acknowledging the gravity of the situation. At that moment, I wanted to shout at Harry, who was nowhere to be found. Yvonne shared that the salon wasn't doing well, and Harry was spending money recklessly every night. I regretted giving that bank book to Harry. It was a mistake. Despite her busy schedule, Yvonne never neglected her hair care, gently stroking her belly. She expressed her desire to teach her child the joy of helping others. Realizing that my son wasn't providing much help, I decided to assist Yvonne at their apartment. Despite her gratitude, she apologized for troubling me. I reassured her, don't worry about it. Just focus on the baby. It was my fault for not raising my son right, and because of that, you're suffering. Perhaps, in a way, it was my attempt to atone for my perceived shortcomings. As summer came to an end, Ivan went into labor earlier than expected and was rushed to the hospital. Harry was nowhere to be found, unreachable. I kept sending him messages, but there were no replies, not even read receipts. At a time like this, with Yvonne's parents no longer around, I was the only one who could be there for her. I reassured her, don't worry, Yvonne. I'm here, as she bravely faced childbirth. After a long and difficult labor, I was overwhelmed by the sound of the baby's cries. He's born. You did it, Ivana. I exclaimed, moved to tears. However, Harry, who should have been there, never showed up. My grandson David was experiencing his first winter, and the weather report mentioned it was a record cold day. Worried about Yvonne and the newborn, I sent a message that night, asking if they were okay and hadn't caught a cold. Despite sending two or three messages, there was no response, not even a read receipt. Concerned that Ivani might be too ill to move, I tried calling again after waiting for another hour. Something was not right. Without a second thought, I put on my thick jumper and rushed to their apartment. Upon arrival, the place was engulfed in darkness. It wasn't uncommon for families to travel abroad during the holidays. But I hadn't heard anything about a trip from Yvonne and Harry, and they likely couldn't afford it. I rang the intercom, but there was no response. Fearing Yvonne might have collapsed, I immediately asked the building manager to open the door. I told the manager I would wait outside and to let me know if there was anything unusual. Stepping inside, the apartment was dark, with only the street lamps providing some light. Groping for the light switch by the entrance, I found it. But the lights didn't respond. Using my smartphone's flashlight, I stepped inside and called out for Yvonne. No answer in the living room, so I headed toward the bedroom upon hearing a faint cry of a baby. There I found Yvonne shivering from the cold, desperately wrapping newborn David in a sheet to keep him warm. Shining the light on her, I was shocked to see that her once long, proud black hair had been roughly cut off, almost to the scalp. Her eyes were red and swollen from crying. Wrapping my jumper around her, I asked, What happened? How did this happen? Yvonne began to speak slowly, sharing that Harry had continued his daily escapades even after David was born. Unable to pay the electric bill, Yvonne scolded him, hoping he would be more responsible as a father. In a fit of rage, Harry grabbed a pair of practice hair-cutting scissors and started cutting off Yvonne's hair. At first, Yvonne resisted, 
but fearing for David's safety, she stopped resisting. Harry mocked her, saying, Now you won't be able to show your face in public. I was left speechless at my son's cruel actions. Why didn't you tell me it had gotten this bad? I asked him. Harry apologized, blaming himself again. I'm sorry, Mom. I am so sorry. Ivan joined in, apologizing as well. No, Ivan, it's not your fault. You're not to blame here. It's Harry who did this. You did nothing wrong, I reassured her. I knew Ivan hadn't confided in me because she didn't want to worry me. I hugged her tightly, tears streaming down my face. The whole situation was a result of my overindulgence in raising Harry. My heart burned with shame and anger at my own failings and my son's inability to empathize with others. Taking a deep breath, I called Harry. Hey, Mom. Long time no talk. What's up? He casually greeted. I cut to the chase. Why have you been avoiding calls? How's everything over there? Is Yvonne and David doing okay? Of course, everyone's fine and doing well. I've been calling home, but no one's picking up, he replied, attempting to divert the conversation. Where are you now? There was a brief pause in his voice before he replied. Actually, we're a family of three in Hawaii. We'll be back next week. Hawaii, huh? That sounds nice, I responded, though I knew he was blatantly lying to me. Over the years, I had worked tirelessly as a hairstylist, raising Harry on my own after losing my husband at a young age. When Harry expressed a desire to become an independent hairstylist, I fulfilled his wish without hesitation. Yet, Harry carelessly squandered the inheritance his father left, using it for his own pleasures and mistreating his wife and child. What would you like as a souvenir? I'll bring you something nice, Harry offered. Anything's fine. You're coming back next week, right? I asked, my tum distant. Safe and sound. Hey, Mom, you sound a bit off. Is something wrong? Harry sensed something, but I ended the call without responding. I informed the building manager of my plans and decided to take Havon and David back to my house. Then, I started making calls to every place I could think of. A week later, Harry called me cheerfully, announcing that he had just landed at the airport. I'm back, Mom, and I've got souvenirs for you, he said, pretending to be the caring son. My heart, however, was no longer deceived by his act. That's nice to hear. I replied in a flat tone, though Harry didn't seem to notice anything unusual. About an hour later, a taxi pulled up in front of the apartment. Harry, having clearly enjoyed his solo trip to Hawaii, with distinct tan lines from sunglasses around his eyes, unloaded a bunch of luggage from the trunk, expecting to enter the apartment where his wife and son should be waiting. He took out his keys, thinking that once inserted and turned, the door would open immediately. However, no matter how many times he tried, the key wouldn't fit the lock. What's going on here? He exclaimed in frustration. I approached him quietly from behind and asked with a smile, Did you enjoy your trip to Hawaii? Though my heart was boiling with anger, Harry, relieved to see me, misunderstood the situation. Listen, Mom, I just got back and tried to enter the house, but the key won't fit. It must be Yvonne's prank, punishing me for going on a trip alone. He tried to paint himself as the victim, blaming Yvonne, leaving his wife and newborn David behind. What were you doing? I told you I was in Hawaii with my family. Didn't he just say you went on the trip alone? I pointed out the contradiction. Harry was at a loss for words. You really had the nerve to lie about taking a family trip to Hawaii. Yvonne was here with the electricity cut off, shivering in the cold, holding David close to protect him. And to think she cherished her long hair. And Harry just cut it off mercilessly. Don't you feel any remorse as a human being? I asked, my disappointment evident. I guess I messed up there, but right now, I just want to get inside the house. It's freezing in Japan, Harry replied, showing no sign of remorse. The cold Yvonne and David endured is nothing compared to this. Plus, you no longer have a home here. I've already canceled the lease on the apartment. Cancel the lease? What? Why would you do something like that without asking me? Harry protested, suddenly panicking. But the apartment was leased under my name. 
I couldn't just stand outside and continue this conversation. So I took Harry to a nearby coffee shop to talk further. Harry sipped his coffee silently, probably not even tasting it, glancing between me and his coffee with a pale face. You were so strapped for cash that you couldn't pay the electric bill. Yet you managed to go to Hawaii. That's impressive. I remarked. And finally, Harry began to spill his selfish reasoning. He admitted that right from the start of his business, he was showing off to friends and women he picked up at the salon, spending his father's inheritance on his antics. He knew such spending would quickly deplete any fortune, but after getting a taste of the power of money, he continued his lavish lifestyle. Even after the inheritance ran out, racking up debts to buy gifts and take trips. If you're so confident in your skills, you should be able to start over from scratch. I said coldly, leaving the coffee shop after placing money for the coffee on the table. A month passed, and Yvonne and I avoided any contact with Harry, but unpleasant rumors inevitably reached my ears. After I pushed him away, Harry apparently ran to his friends, begging for money. However, they were the kind who gathered around him for his money. And naturally, nobody was willing to help a financially drained Harry. He even got reported to the police for stalking some of the women he picked up at his salon. Although he only received a stern warning from the police, the lack of support from his acquaintances hit him hard, and he completely disappeared from our lives. He was probably living alone now, in fear of harsh debt collectors. All this was the consequence of his own actions. My anger towards Harry wasn't just about his reckless spending. What was unforgivable was how he neglected Yvonne and David, pushing them into hardship, and, above all, cutting off Yvonne's long hair, which she had grown out for years for a noble cause, potentially robbing unknown children of a brighter future. As a fellow hairstylist, I could never forgive Harry's actions. It would take a long time for Harry to truly understand the emotional pain Yvonne has endured. Yvonne herself never spoke of her hurt, but it was clear she wasn't unscathed. She appeared to be keeping her feelings bottled up, probably not wanting to worry me, wanting to do something to help. I reached out to my hairstylist friends and had a special wig made for Yvonne. It won't make up for my son's wrongs, but please use this, I told her. Thank you, Mom, Yvonne said with a smile, though tears were streaming down her cheeks. Using my aching back as an excuse, I asked Yvonne to help out at the salon. She threw herself into the work, seemingly trying to forget her emotional scars. Hello, David, a regular greeted, and David in his cradle burst into giggles. Now, some customers even come to the salon just to see him. He's like a little mascot, a baby that brings in good fortune. Yvonne, regaining her strength both physically and emotionally, has started the process of divorcing Harry. Seeing Yvonne's smile makes us all feel like we've shed 20 years, but it's true. Yvonne and David have brightened up the salon considerably. Attracted by Yvonne's cheerful atmosphere, more and more mothers with young children have become regulars. Let's have a great day today. Yvonne greets customers. Hi, how are you? Now the salon is filled with smiles again. In a quiet corner, David is peacefully sleeping, his cute little snores filling the air. 